Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome back after a recess and uh, also welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to please turn off uh, mobile phones and other electronic devices. We have received apologies this morning from Michael McMahon. Our first item of business this morning is to decide whether to take items three and four in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Members have indicated their agreement. Our second item of business is to take evidence in a round table format from Lloyd Austin of RSPB Scotland, uh, Professor Jim Baird uh, of Glasgow Caledonian University, uh, Willie Beattie of uh, Scottish Landfill Communities Fund Forum, Stephen Freeland of CESA, uh, Mary McCluskey of Community Resources Network Scotland and Jenny Sports of the Scottish Wildlife Trust. Now, the purpose of this session is to inform the committee's consideration of draft subordinate legislation relating to the Landfill Tax Act as contained in the government's recent consultation. And the consultation also included questions on proposals relating to the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund. Now, obviously, um, today we have a round table format and there are, are 12 of us. And what I really want is a kind of free-flowing discussion on any issues um, in relation to the Landfill uh, Scotland uh, Act 2014 and our, our deliberations of the subordinate legislation. But just to kind of kick us off, I'm just wondering if uh, perhaps uh, Mary McCluskey uh, can perhaps uh, start um, but before you do, uh, just to let people know that uh, I'm not taking people in any kind of order. If people actually want to, to speak, um, just basically let me know um, by you know putting up your hand or something like that, and I'll take people in any kind of order. So it may be that after Mary speaks, people would want to either say something completely different from Mary on a different aspect of this, uh, or they may wish to comment on what Mary said or add their own uh, kind of comments. And uh, I think the bit we will start off, Mary, because this is probably an issue that a number of people will want to have a view on, is the issue of projects within 10 miles of a landfill site or waste transfer station to be eligible for funding. This was something that there was quite a lot of discussion and deliberation on in the uh, committee. Uh, now, what you basically have said is uh, that uh, uh, CRNS would um, like the radius to be applied flexibly, with a diminishing level of funding for those on the periphery, and you suggest uh, that a 25 mil radius would be appropriate. I'm sure we've all got views on that. So I wonder if you can just kick us off uh, with that, and then I'll take people as I see them. You can come in as often as you like, incidentally. It's not a Buggins turn kind of uh, session. Anyone can come in as often or as infrequently as you so wish. And John Mason has already said he wants to come in straight away. So, But Mary, okay, over to yourself. You. Yeah, CRNS is very supportive of uh, the ability for community projects to access funds. Um, with the regard to the 10-mile radius, what we thought was it ha has been applied flexibly in the past and we'd want that to continue. Our emphasis and focus would be that we would look for funding to be very much directed to those projects in the community who are actively seeking to reduce landfill. So, in, indeed, in terms of the 10-mile radius and in, in, in transfer also, that the flexibility of that approach would be applied across with an emphasis on making sure that those projects who can demonstrate that they're actually reducing landfill uh, would be given priority uh, in, in terms of funding and that the, the flexibility that's previously been applied would continue to be applied and indeed the 25 miles is equally a sort of notional uh, uh, figure because we all know the shape and size of Scotland in terms of its geography and how difficult just putting a dot on the map can actually make it. So it, the, the focus really was not so much the, the actual mileage per, per se but on the quality and the, the ability of projects to actually make an actual impact on the environment by reducing landfill and, and uh, making a, a keeping resources within its local community. Thank you very much for that. Deputy Convener. Yeah, I mean, Michael McMahon's not here today, and I, I don't know exactly what he would say. I know he's also committed to the idea that it should be the local community that really benefits from this. And in my context in Glasgow, I just feel 10 miles is, is enormous. I mean, I, I've got a, a landfill site at the very edge of my constituency, which is also the very edge of the city, if you know it. It's at Dowie eh, near the crematorium. And 10 miles covers the whole of Glasgow. Now, I don't accept that the whole of Glasgow is suffering because of that landfill site. I would have said it was the local community that was suffering. So I just wonder how people think about that. Yeah, I can back on that. I think that, 
That's why we focused on the impact that the community uh, organisations would make and indeed the criteria to, to look at what they actually were doing and how they would actually reduce landfill because I accept completely that in a, a, a city centre environment, 10 mile radius is huge, but if you took that out into a rural uh, environment, then again, you're, you're looking at a much more flexible approach. So the flexibility would be both within and without that 10 miles. But I think it's the impact of the projects and their ability to actually do something much more positive is what we were really focusing on. OK. Um, Lloyd, to be followed by Jean. Um, I, I think Mary's um, follow-up there has covered what I was going to say. I think the key thing is the legislation uses the phrase in the vicinity of, and the guidance explains how that should be interpreted. And, I mean, we support the in the vicinity of approach because the principle is that the fund should address disamenities due to landfill. And I think the, the key issue is that the flexibility is about applying different uh, approaches in different circumstances and John Mason's comment about the city centre is absolutely tr true. In the central belt the flexibility should be different to in, in a rural area um, and you know I think the key thing will be to encourage the government when they produce the guidance of how the rule should be applied to explain what form of flexibility should be applied and how it should be applied. Um, the, the final thing I was going to say is the convener said 10 kilometres from a landfill site or transfer station and we agree with the idea of applying the transfer station and expanding the scheme in that way where there is disamenity from such transfer stations but the regulations as drafted still just refer to landfill sites so there is a need to ensure that the regulations do um, extend to that, that new area that's being spoken about. Okay, just to just for accuracy, it's not kilometres, it's miles we're talking about. We're not moved on to the metric scale on this as yet. Uh, sorry, Jean, to be followed by Malcolm. Uh, thanks, Davina. I Yes, I, I think there is still a, a, a bit of unravelling to do about this because representing a rural area, 10 miles, of course, is is nothing um, in terms of the distance that, that uh, landfill material will travel and the distance from a landfill site potentially to um, either a social enterprise or other organisation that's actually working um, to the kind of remit that we might like to see that, that uh, reducing landfill uh, materials. So it seems to me that there's, there's two things to be done because when we looked at some of the awards that had been made in the past, it, it wasn't necessarily about reducing landfill, but it certainly was about improving the environment for people who lived next to uh, a landfill site. And I think that's still really relevant. But I, I think that the, maybe it is uh, an issue that we either um, take the... just don't declare a, a, a distance at all, and in fact are much clearer in the specifics or the criteria for applying to the fund. Okay, Malcolm, to followed by Jamie. I'm still on the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund. I, I was interested in the remark from the Scottish Environmental Services Association who were critical of the proposal to abolish and trust and to split responsibility between the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund and CEPA. And I, I was really interested in to hear more about that. I mean, it may be that you want to take some more comments about the distance issue, but I just thought since we were dealing with this fund, we should uh, also look at that particular aspect of it. No, I'm happy to, uh, to bring Stephen in, uh, uh, as in many so wishes. Um, um, Jamie, to be followed by Jenny. Yeah, well, it's, it's still on the, uh, the fund issue, and uh, can I say from my own perspective, I think that given that we know it's a, a flexible uh, measure. I think the 10 mile uh, radius is actually a, a about right, but I thought it was interesting to see that a number of witnesses, Scottish Wildlife Trust, uh, welcome uh, waste transfer stations being uh, added, uh, as well as landfill sites. Uh, say they recognise communities and natural environment around these facilities also suffer disability from transport of waste. RSPB say something similar, uh, so do CRNS, but uh, the uh, Chartered Institution of Waste Management. It see that there's no evidence it, for the disability of transfer stations, so that's obviously a contradiction. I'm just wondering if, if, if people can talk a little bit more about that. And also, if I may uh, convener, uh, I thought it was interesting that CRS uh, also thought recycling 
activity should be included in, uh, I should declare that's very interesting for me because from a constituency perspective there's a recycling facility in Cumberland Old that frankly is essentially a de facto landfill site because the amount of material that is constantly there if you are living next to it it's probably a moot point that is a, a, a recycling facility so if we could maybe get a comment on that and a little bit more evidence that would be very interested in that. Okay. Thank you. Followed by Stephen. Really, on the distance issue, um, I agree that, it, well, in the past, it has always just been guidance rather than a rule. Um, and I think it's important that uh, we, we continue with that just being guidance and there's flexibility there for, for the distributors of the fund to, to make a call on whether they feel it's appropriate for that project or not. Um, just to give an example of a, a, a city centre um, project, we've received funding from the Landfill Communities Fund for saving Scotland's red squirrels from the city of Aberdeen. Uh, and so the, the, the project activity has taken place within 10 miles of a landfill site and it's benefiting the whole of the city of Aberdeen uh, to have... Um, a native species conserved within that city so that the, the, the residents of the, the city can enjoy red squirrels returning to the city uh, and they also get the economic de benefit from the, the tourism factor that red squirrels bring. So, uh, yeah, I just really wanted to reiterate that I think we need to keep that flexibility, um, particularly, I think, for biodiversity projects. Um, Stephen, to be followed by Willie. Um, before I answer um, uh, Malcolm's question there, we have to be quite clear on the definition of a transfer station. I don't think there's any legal definition of what a transfer station is. And you'll find that transfer station operations are quite often bolted on to uh, another plant. So we have to be very careful as we, uh, if we're looking to apply transfer stations that we, we know exactly what we're talking about. But on the issue of the um, of interest, um, we're not saying we're entirely critical of abolishing interest. It's more of a putting down a, a marker more than anything else. Um, the, at the moment, we've got one body that is uh, registering, administrating, and regulating the system. Uh, and under the current proposals, we're splitting that uh, to two bodies: a forum and to SIPA. So at the moment, there's not enough detail uh, in the consultation to. Have any confidence that it's going to be a more efficient system, but I think maybe others might be better qualified to actually uh, comment on the specifics of that. Okay. Um, well, do you want to comment on that specifically, or do you want to come in on something else? Okay. Uh, Willie to be followed by Joan. Yes. I want to comment on the ten mile radius, but I want to also comment on, on that last point, if that's okay. Within the terms of the ten mile radius. Um, Working within the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund Forum, my own organisation, have always taken the view that waste that uh, causes disamenity, not just at landfill, uh, but in its collection, processing and transportation. And our policy over all these years has been to apply some of our funds to areas where the waste is collected, but most of the funds still within the 10 mile radius of the landfill site. Now, that is a voluntary situation, but it has worked quite well and seems to have been pretty well received. With respect to the, the, the uh, abolition of Entrust, uh, Entrust costs the UK scheme about £1.5 million at present, and uh, that, that would translate to roughly 150000 per annum in Scotland, which could actually go into projects. Um, also, under the current arrangements, Entrust have got to uh, regulate not just distributive environmental bodies, but environmental bodies. So you're talking in excess of 2,000 organisations. Uh, the Scottish proposals would be for something like six, seven, or maybe eight organisations that are required to be regulated by, NA, by SEPA. Uh, perhaps most importantly, though, from our point of view, here we are 18 years almost into the scheme, and I think it's fair to say that the UK government doesn't have a very clear picture as to how successful or not the scheme has been. And I would hope that through the, the proposals that have been laid down, that the, from, from the get-go, if you like, the, the information flow uh, in the proposed arrangements would allow uh, the Scottish government uh, to know on a very, very 
precise nature how well this fund is performing or not in the future. Okay, thank you very much for that. John, to follow by Mary. Yes, it was to come back partly on what Jenny had said. Uh, I mean, I'm also a fan of red squirrels, and I'm sure most people in Aberdeen like red squirrels. Um, but the people suffering from the landfill, would you accept? In, in some cases, it's only within 100 metres of a landfill site, where you know, in my, some of my constituents, the, the, across the road is the landfill site. Six o'clock in the morning, they've got huge lorries queuing up to get into the landfill site. The, the dust in the road is just you know, dirt, and just all the time, their windows, their cars, all covered in it. So, I mean, it is, it, the 10 miles is just, would you accept that that's, that's kind of huge? And while we might want to do things with red squirrels, some of the money at least needs to go to help the people right at the site. Yeah, no, I would definitely agree with that. I, th I, think it's, I think it's important for the community's fund to be able to fund both. Um, and that's what it's been doing so far. And I think it should continue to, we should continue to have that flexibility to fund projects directly you know, in the communities that suffer the huge disamenity, as well as the wider community that also suffer from transport issues. I mean, would you accept, do you think that there could be too much flexibility in a sense because then anything can go? Um, uh, well, I think I, I think the way that the way it's worked today has worked well. I mean, we have the ten mile guidance. Some funders have have increased that to twenty five miles for cer for certain projects for biodiversity projects. Um, and pretty much all the funders I've kept within those guidelines. So I think that's, that's an appropriate degree of flexibility, uh, and, and I would support that continuing. OK, Mary, to be followed by Lloyd. Uh, I think the, the, the discussion around 10 miles, 25 miles, or whatever notional number that we put on it, I think actually skews the debate away from what we really want to do, which is impact on those who are... Uh, disproportionately um, affected by landfill sites and the transfer of waste to and from. Um, the focus of the response that CRNS gave was really to try and highlight that if we're looking at funding projects, we should try and make the, the funds go to those projects that try and reduce the amount of uh, materials going into landfill, so the re reduce repair, recycling, etc., um, and to look at how we actually uh, make better use of the communities around those areas that are affected. So a 10 mile or a 25 or whatever flexible radius that we want to apply, I think it's on a needs basis so that we make a, a greater impact on what, what we actually are trying to do, which is ultimately follow a, a, a zero waste uh, agenda. I also think that the, in terms of some of the other comments that were made around things like Entrust, we are strongly in favour that uh, the, the monies that would be saved by removing that regulation would be put back into uh, community-based projects for the very purpose of impacting positively on the environment. And I'd also say that uh, research that we had conducted in France uh, around the polluter pays model showed that, in fact, uh, if uh, a different approach was taken to how uh, revenue was raised and then redistributed, there is a model there that could actually make a, a great impact <coughs> on the Scottish environment um, and how we actually fund community-based projects to reduce and re reuse um, and therefore reduce the amount of landfill. Um, and the debate, I suppose, about the radius then potentially would become mute over time, or at least should become mute over time. OK. Lloyd? Um, yeah, just further comment on this question of flexibility. I mean, I do think flexibility in the 10-mile um, rule is a good thing, but I think how that flexibility is applied should be clearly set out in the guidance. And I think how that is set out and how that's applied needs to be thought about in the context of the various objects of the schemes, the objects that the funding should apply uh, uh, to. So... Mary's mentioned the recycling one, there's, there's the various other uh, amenity ones, and the ones we're particularly interested in is object B, the biodiversity one. And it will be that some objects will have a tendency to be more specifically focused on the immediate community, and some objects will have a tendency to be more focused on the general, more widespread community that everyone benefits from. And I think the way in which the funds are allocated across the objects is one of the issues of how that flexibility can be applied. So in terms of applying the flexibility guidance, 
it might be good for the government to include in that some guidance about ensuring that each of the objects gets a, a good allocation of money or a, the allocation of money to the different objects is in a sense part of the flexibility. Um, I mean, we're especially keen on the biodiversity object being maintained because it's one of the few funding schemes that exist uh, where uh, pure biodiversity conservation and improvement is a specific object. And, you know, we're particularly pleased to see that the government has retained that. Gavin. Thank you. I certainly would welcome um, further detail from anyone. Um, on the issue of the distribution system and whether uh, NTRUST should continue to have a regulatory role. Um, I'd welcome any um, benefits that people think would arise if you were to remove um, them from the role, but also any potential risks of removing them uh, from the role too. And on the, uh, Mr Beatty made the, the comment about, I think NTRUST approximately costs um, about £150,000 out of the fund. Um, if you do remove them, there's presumably still some cost in terms of distribution and administration. So is, is the view that it could be done cheaper than the 150000 by having SEPA or somebody else? And, and if so, what, what sort of costs are we talking about? Because presumably it wouldn't, it wouldn't be nil, um, so you couldn't spend all of that money on the fund. So I just welcome further details on that. I think it would be helpful for us as a committee when we have to take a view. Willie, I'm going to let you come back and then I'm, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Jenny if she can comment because uh, in your submission in the Scottish Wildlife Trust, um, you've um, made a, a number of points on this particular issue. So, Willie, and then we'll move on to Jenny. And then open it up, obviously, for anyone else who wants to comment on this issue. It is proposed that members of the, the forum uh, adopt a code of conduct which includes a, a, a fully set of audited counts every year. Uh, as there will be a limited amount of these organisations, the burden on SEPA to regulate those organisations is much less than the current system. It is also proposed that there will be a cap of 10% on administration costs. Uh, that's not the case at the minute. It's guidance at the minute. And uh, the costs to the distributive environmental bodies who are members of the forum uh, would be met within that 10%. Uh, I think also just to add that I think SEPA have committed to providing a regulatory service on a cost-only basis. So I think, uh, although there's no figures around that, I think a substantial saving would be inevitable. Okay, uh, Jen, to follow by Jim. Uh, yeah, I would just agree that um, I think a lot of the roles that Entrust are carrying out are actually duplicating um, what the organisations that, that uh, distribute and receive the, 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 the funds already do. Um, in any particular project, we're, we're providing the same information to the funder and to Entrust that actually the same information is held in two places and it's duplication of effort. We're audited on an annual basis by Entrust, uh, both on fi a financial level and a governance level which we feel is uh, superfluous, really, because we already have an audit as, you know, as the organisation that we are. We have a general audit. And um, the governance issues, actually, Entrust should not have any role in, I would say, anyway, it's more a guidance role that, that, that they're giving there. So I think, as Willie said, I think the... The functions that the Entrust are carrying out can can easily and much more cheaply be carried out uh, under the system that's been proposed in this in uh, in this document. Jim, yeah, I, mean, I think everyone would accept that landfills are a disamenity, and if you live near Daldoe, then a, there are issues and problems in those communities. Uh, and I think everyone would agree that somehow localising the funding around those communities is the right way to go. And largely that's how it's worked over the past uh, you know, 10, 15 years of funding. I've, I've had the opportunity to serve on quite a few panels, local panels, from several environmental bodies who are, who are giving out the funding. And they've all developed a similar scoring system so that if you're within three miles of a landfill, you get so many points and, and so on and so on. And there's a diminishing 
the further you go. And if you fall outside of that, you obviously it rules you out entirely from submitting an application in, in some cases. But they've all broadly moved towards the, the idea of somehow giving more money to the communities that are, are very local to the landfills. I sit in those panels and quite often there's quite a lot of local authority elected members represented. There's people like me who are independent and then there's organisations like uh, Scottish Wildlife Trust and so on. And so you're getting this discussion going on in a balanced view. You're seeing local authorities coming to the table under pressure because parks and funding for their areas have been cut dramatically. They're pressing for certain things to happen and then there's a balancing going on and I think that distributed bodies have done very well to try and work through a scheme that seems to work for communities. And when you speak to communities, they seem to get it and benefit from it. Uh, I think there's a danger if in the next round of discussions where you start to be over-prescriptive about the rules and regulations, you just might suddenly find, yeah, OK, you know, it's got to be three miles around Daldau, but you may then suddenly find projects that you don't really want emerging and coming forward, and the objectives might be constrained, and you might find you can't actually spend the money in that community. It's, it, it's, a, it's a fine balance getting the uh, flexibility uh, around, around that to work, and I think the scheme's done that. I, I'll, a little point made, Jamie, about uh, where I no evidence around transfer stations. Can I just pick that point up? And it wasn't that I was saying there's no evidence. I think no one is turning around and saying in uh, Mavis, Mavis Valley, Mavis Bank, Mavis Valley in Eastern Bartonshire, which is a transfer station of waste going from there out to Green Gears, as an example. So that's in. Uh, North Glasgow, uh, uh, Eastern Bartonshire. I mean, no one has any evidence to say that all those vehicles are causing a problem. There's plenty of evidence to say in Green Gears there's a blight, there's a community there who's sitting right next to landfill. So it's clear there. But how we actually measure the number of vehicles and so on, there's no evidence to say house prices are diminished as a consequence of that exercise, that activity. So I think we're just saying there's no evidence. But I do... I do agree that if there are vehicles coming in and out, there is some disamenity, and therefore we should try and reflect that in the guidance. OK, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on, um, maybe because, primarily because no-one else has said they want to actually make a contribution. So I'm going to move on to the issue, which will probably be a no-brainer here. It's the issue of the 10% increase in funding for the first three years of operation compared to the current system, uh, with the new cap being proposed at 7.48%. Uh, well, you've said... This is a welcome proposal at a time when the LCF has been effectively reduced in value to accommodate other government UK policies. So uh, what's your uh, further view on that? Yes, uh, I was referring there to the fact that at the last budget, um, uh, the, the government uh, reduced the diversion percentage for, for landfill tax credits, uh, principally to uh, address another particular policy that, that, that they wanted to do. And the, the concern amongst everybody was if it can happen once, it may happen again. So therefore, uh, the increase was, was seen as very welcome, particularly because of that, that point of view, and the fact that it would give the scheme some momentum in its early, early days uh, as a Scottish Landfill Communities Fund. OK, anyone want to comment on that particular issue? Uh, Mary? I'd just uh, like to reiterate, yeah, I agree with what Willie's just said there, a 10% increase would be very welcome. But I also think that, linking back to what Jenny had said previously in the previous comments, I think simplicity and transparency around criteria and reduction of uh, duplication of effort would be very welcome. A lot of small organisations that I represent just do not have the resource to constantly fill in forms or make meetings or get to... Uh, telephone calls or whatever, um, to continually uh, apply and reapply using the same information over and again to different bodies. So an increase in fund and a reduction in the administration, I think, go hand in hand and are very welcome. OK, thank you. Jenny? Uh, yeah, I would uh, I agree with that. Um, as Mary said, I think that's a, another point really on the interest issue is that the removal of that level of administration will make it easier for smaller community groups to apply for this funding and again community groups that are closer to the actual landfill so that's a, that's a welcome thing and again yes of course as a, as a, a fundraiser I welcome an increase in available funding um, 
I think, again, the important thing on this is that it offsets the fact that in, in under the previous scheme or the current scheme, uh, some of the credits that are collected in England are actually distributed up in Scotland. So there, there, would, there could possibly be an increase in the funding available under the scheme for projects in Scotland um, as the transition occurs. So, yes, we definitely welcome this, this 10% increase. OK, thank you. I'm, I'm going to move on uh, again, actually, uh, to Stephen's paper, actually, which is somewhat different from some of the issues we've been discussing so far. Um, Stephen, um, uh, of course, is here representing the Scottish Environmental Service Association, uh, CESA, which is a sectoral trade association for Scotland's managers of waste and secondary resources. And you've expressed uh, one or two concerns, actually, uh, Stephen, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to expand on. For example, uh, you've talked about the third rate of tax. You've said that uh, we are therefore concerned by references in the current consultation to the potential introduction of a third intermediary rate of tax. And you go on to say that this is only likely to introduce an additional layer of complexity to what is generally a well understood system. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you can talk specifically about that issue and your concerns regarding uh, uh, price variation, etc. Yeah, at the moment we've got uh, two tax rates, a standard and a lower rate. And within the consultation there was a suggestion that there could be a third rate. It doesn't say what material and such like, but we assume that perhaps they're referring to biostabilised material had been raised in for our previous consultations, that that might be a material which might benefit from a, from a lower rate. Um, and the concern is that this might have implications for the, the, the economic case for other types of existing and planned infrastructure. So, for example, uh, if you have a, a lower rate, a lower landfill rate for biostabilised material, uh, that would imply after some sort of processing to, rem to remove the biodegradable content of that material, uh, you would be able to landfill at a cheaper rate. So you're, you're incentivising that means of treatment. And the main means of treating this material, for example, is through a mechanical biological treatment process, which is basically uh, a means of taking residual waste and uh, removing its biodegradable content to produce uh, more uh, um, a stabilised material at the back end. But these facilities are also producing a fuel, uh, RDF or SRF, and this fuel uh, can then be um, used in cement kilns or, or, or burned to create energy. So by incentivising the landfill of this material, uh, th these facilities are then going to potentially be reconfigured uh, to produce a biostabilised material for a landfill to benefit from the cheaper rates, uh, whereas other processes further up the waste hierarchy, such as waste uh, energy recovery, uh, are going to be impacted. So at the moment it's very much um, guesswork, as we don't know what materials are going to be uh, covered by the scope of this at uh, lower rate and when it might apply. So it's almost as putting out a marker that uh, this has to be very, very carefully considered. Um, otherwise, you might be jeopardising other projects. OK, thank you very much. I'm going to let um, John come back and then I'm going to come back to you. John? OK, well, it was... I mean, there's obviously some technical language in here, which I confess I'm not altogether familiar with. And, and particularly in paragraph 9, um, you talk about fines. I wonder if you just clarify us what fines are and l the loss of ignition test, quite it's what that slight, means. Yes, yeah, it's a slightly different uh, issue. Uh, this comes down to the, the current um, lower rates of tax for qualifying materials. And the 2011 Qualifying Materials Order lists those uh, inert or inactive wastes which benefit from the lower rate of tax because they've got less environmental harm when you're, when you're landfilling. And the current uh, proposals within the consultation are, are fine. They, they duplicate more or less what's in the current UK system that we've all got to know of over the years. The, the, the glaring gap is when it comes down to fines. And fines are the, the small particles, the small materials that are the residues from a recycling process after the material has been trundled around in a big screen to separate out the plastics and the paper. There's a, a residual amount of uh, fine dust or fine material that escapes out the, uh, out the back end. 
And by looking at this material, when it arrives at the landfill sites, when it arrives there, uh, it's very hard to ascertain whether that fine material is biodegradable, whether it's come from a, um, uh, biodegradable sources, such as paper, or whether it's come from inert material. And it's very hard to make that judgment call there and then. So HMRC at the moment is planning uh, a more scientific approach to testing that material when it arrives on the landfill sites. Because the problem is that some unscrupulous operators might just be passing off as a lower rate of, um, of tax when really it should qualify for the higher rate of tax. Is, is there much of that happens, do you reckon? There, there, there is a, a strong indication that is, is happening. Uh, so this scientific process is called loss on ignition, which essentially the material goes back to a lab. It's fired up, essentially. And by knowing how much is burnt off from how much you started off with, determines whether it's a biodegradable content or whether it's a largely inert. And then this confidence then that landfill operator has complied with his requirements under the, under the regime to ensure that material was taxed at the appropriate rate. So that's currently just going on at the moment with the HMRC. And our concern was there's no reference in this consultation whatsoever on that aspect. And I think uh, the most landfill operators would be looking for this level of confidence and would be quite keen for the Scottish Government to adopt a similar scientific approach to, to fines. Thank you. I, bet I was going to come back to you on was that specific issue, so I'm not going to come back to you on that. I'm going to let Jim in and then to be followed by Jamie. Yeah, um, on, on, the, on the question of the, the tax and the three rates, I think the one thing that I think I said previously to this committee that has made a difference, and everyone would accept uh, in, in the industry that's made a difference and changed our approach to recycling and recovery and so on has been the landfill tax. It's the one driver, regulatory driver, because it's costs. So I think, I think the, the important thing is that you're setting a marker down that that is the price and you're providing the operators and those in the industry with certainty on what it's going to cost. And I think the danger is that if you do start to slip in different arrangements, you affect the economics of the kind of waste infrastructure that might might uh, em emerge. Uh, so that, that's on that point. On the, f on the question of, of fines, uh, yes, I think what's happened over the summer is the HMRC are consulting on this this very issue and trying to uh, and, and bringing forward uh, a methodology to prevent this organic fines working its way into a landfill and being classified as an art when it isn't an art, and the loss on ignition is effectively saying, well, if you can burn it and it disappears, then it's organic and it's not an art. So that, that, that's, that's at its, its simplest. And I guess all, all uh, we're saying in our response to Scottish Government through our, through our, through our consultation uh, submission is, you know, we want to try and mirror what England and Wales are doing at the present. So let's, let's reflect that. Let's not at this stage try and deviate too much. So we think you should take on board this issue of the fines and uh, you know, follow what HMRC are doing. Okay. Jamie? It's a slightly different uh, issue that was raised in uh, Stephen's paper, uh, Convener, and it's the issue of tax exemption for site remediation where uh, either SEPA or a, a local authority have to, to clear up uh, something that should have gone to landfill. They're obviously exempt from tax uh, liability and uh, Stephen's paper says, however, this should not simply provide a convenient alternative exhausting all possible avenues to recovering tax from the illegal or insolvent operator in the first instance. Uh, and I noticed that uh, Willie's paper kind of makes the same point, although you say this would be probably unlikely. Um, but you know, how, how serious a concern uh, is this? Well, by and large, we, we support that measure um, as, a, as a welcome uh, introduction, uh, but it was more again just to, to, to point on the marker, place on the marker there that uh, don't take the, the easy option by just disposing of this stuff without uh, having to worry about the tax. Uh, it is very hard to, if it's in legal operation, for example, it's very hard to, uh, in some cases, recover that tax from the operator. Um, but by and large, we do support that measure. Okay, um, John. Thanks. It, it was a separate point, uh, Mr. Freeland, in your report, a uh, paragraph two. You talk about waste tourism, and I mean this has been raised before that if tax rates are different, or there was different bans, or all of that area, then waste starts moving around Scotland, England, or whatever. 
are, are you aware of there been any studies done as to you know how much uh, how sensitive it is? You know, if, if rates were one percent different, would that be just ignored, or is there any kind of rule of thumb on, on that area? I'm, I'm not aware of any published studies. There was a, a report that accompanied the, the the Act and the Boom done by Zero Waste Scotland, but I think they looked at it uh, in terms of. Uh, there being a UK rate and no Scottish rate, and it didn't quite address the sensitivities around this, um, a slightly closer uh, rate between the two regimes. But my broad understanding is that around about the £10 mark is enough to get the material to, to move to another uh, area around the UK. But the, the waste tourism, I think, has been described by a lot of people probably in, in previous meetings as well. But when it comes down to this uh, dewatering issue in the, in, in the consultation, which I'm not sure whether we'll probably come on to later on, this really okay, this highlights the waste tourism, so we'll wait till the next one to talk about it now. <laughs> they like Jim in, actually, and I'm going to ask you about dewatering. Uh, RSPB have also mentioned that particular issue, but I'll let Jim in. Yeah, the one, one thing that happens is that waste moves, and indeed we... You know, it, it should be no surprise that waste actually moves from the UK over to continental Europe where it's processed. So if it can move those distances, it can certainly move down across into England. So it's a sensitive issue that I don't know of any studies that have been done on it, but I do know waste does move and therefore it's likely to find its way to these cheaper outlets. Okay. I'm going to move on to dewatering um, again on your own paper, Stephen. Uh, in dewatering, you say in paragraph 13, I quote, CISA strongly urges the Scottish Government to refrain from removing the existing provision which enables water to be discounted from taxable disposals. Uh, the economic impact of this proposal on Scottish businesses uh, should be carefully considered. And you go on to say in paragraph 14 that uh, while the number of affected businesses is relatively small, the financial implications on such companies would be severe. So again, I want you to expand on that. And Lloyd, you've also commented on that, so I'd like you to come in after Stephen. That's OK. Stephen. There's, there's a provision within the current UK tax regime that allows you to add water to waste, uh, whether that be as part of the, the, the production process or to assist in its uh, transport. Uh, so dampening it down to avoid it all uh, blowing up the back of the truck as it's making its way down the road. But I can only imagine that the, the, the incentive behind this is to try and incentivise dewatering of the waste uh, at points of production. But to me, it, it, it just really can't work too well when there will be cheaper disposal options down south. Uh, where the, presumably the, the existing watering provision uh, discount remains in place. So, for example, if there's a, a, com a, a customer who might benefit from a 50% discount on the, the tax rate um, on his waste material, uh, if that was to be removed, and that's also a £40 additional tax, which he will be accountable for in the Scottish regime, you can transport that material down south, anywhere down south, for under £40 a tonne. Um, so until, unless the whole of UK was to adopt the same regime, that's the only way you're going to uh, incentivise dewatering. If there's two different systems, and it will, as Jim said earlier on, the waste will move to the, the cheapest option. So that means the material will then end, end up landfills in England, which means the Scottish government loses out on its, its revenue. Um, Scottish businesses will be at a competitive disadvantage to the UK counterparts. The waste industry loses out as well, and obviously less funding to the to the um, the communities fund. Okay, Lloyd, to followed by Jim. Yeah, thank you, Camille. I mean, I think we recognise there are pros and cons of of this, and the the consultation paper sets out that you know the issue of um, excess water being allowed into landfill, or or you know if the dewatering um, discount is not there, will, will that encourage excess water to be allowed into landfill, causing leachate and pollution problems? That's one side of it. But the other side of it is this issue of uh, waste tourism that's just been described. And I think on balance from our understanding uh, that the ban on liquid waste and other things and the other mechanisms that you can use to control the pollution issues 
versus the, the, the waste tourism type problem. And the waste tourism problem not only generates more transport potentially and so on, but it also takes resources out of the Scottish Landfill Communities Fund for communities and projects. Um, I think on balance we felt that keeping the same regime as down south at this stage would be the best thing to do in the short term and think about it again later possibly. But at this stage, I think a big change would be potentially disruptive. Jim? I wasn't sure about this because this, this was something that kind of emerged in the most recent consultation. Uh, is it because it's complex to work out? Uh, I, I don't know. I looked at the HMRC guidance on it and they're quite, they're quite specific about what counts and what doesn't count. We're not talking about waste where the liquid can flow out of the waste so it's a leachate and so on. You know, you can have quite a solid cake and still have quite a bit of moisture content in it. So I, I wasn't quite sure. I was trying to, trying to look at it and I'm thinking, well, actually, it's not the operator's issue. This is actually an industrial issue. It, it's, it's industry supplying the landfill operator with a waste that makes it easy for them to manage the process. So it's going to be an implication on businesses that are, that are applying this. I'm thinking, well, why, why do we want to ban landfill? Well, liquid wastes are not allowed in landfill. That's fine. What I was looking for in, in the consultation was a sense of the scale. I, I had no feel for how many businesses were claiming this, uh, this arrangement. Uh, therefore, I couldn't work out how much water was there for getting into a landfill. Uh, if it was to attempt to try and prevent a liquid getting into landfill, then you'd think, well, hang on, you know, it rains in landfill, so we're up against it there. So I think I just wanted to see, and certainly the CIWM response was, was let's see what the scale of the problem is before we actually do away with this uh, this uh, allowance. That was, that, was my, that was our view. Okay, Jamie. It's actually taking a conversation back a little bit, so I don't know if others want to comment this. I'm happy to come in later, but no, no? okay. Fine it's just I noticed, uh, I raised earlier the issue that was in uh, the CRS paper about uh, the 10 mile radius and recycling activity being included, and I didn't hear any uh, response, And given I've got a constituency uh, interest in this, although it's a bit of a moot point because we probably fall within the 10 mile radius anyway, but I think it'd still send a, a positive message. I, I would like to uh, hear bit more detail as to why uh, CRNS thinks that recycling activity should be included as well as transfer stations. One else had asked to speak on dewatering, so I'm quite happy to go back to that particular issue. Um, Mary and then Willie. Ultimately, um, uh, CRNS's view is that the landfill tax and the funds available to communities should reduce because the in, in amount of landfill over time should reduce. Therefore, we, uh, we see it as a diminishing fund, hopefully. Um, that might take us some time to get to that position, but that is where we would be. Uh, what we argue in our paper overall is that, in fact, we need a different approach and that what we're really talking about just now is the end result, where we get to the point where something has to actually go to landfill. And what we argue uh, quite strongly in our, our paper is that, in fact, we should be attacking it from the very start of the process so that we prevent it going to landfill, which is why we include recycling and reuse and repair in our context in the paper. So that it, ultimately, over time, what you have is better use of resources, resources being reused instead of going to landfill at all. So uh, that may take us a very long time to get to that position, but ultimately, if you are using resources properly and reusing them, recycling and, and uh, repair, recycle uh, and reuse, then the amount of landfill should diminish over time. So ultimately, the landfill tax would diminish over time. When we refer to the model, the levy system in France, where they've implemented a system, albeit for furniture in France, uh, but the model itself could be applied to any particular uh, 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 manufactured good where the uh, levy uh, for um, any product which is sold, furniture uh, in France, manufactured or otherwise, so if it's imported, if it's made in France or whatever, they levy uh, a tax effectively on that to prevent landfill um, uh, accumulating. They do it in two different methods, for, one for domestic furniture and one for industrial furniture. So in effect, they've taken the step uh, that 
they are trying to reduce the landfill uh, ultimately from the start, so from an end-to-end -end delivery system, if you like. So consequently, we would strongly advocate that uh, recycling and reuse and repair uh, organisations were focused very much on any funds that come out of any uh, landfill fund that's available. But equally, we would be looking to see a much longer strategic way, approach to reducing landfill ultimately overall. Okay. Molly? Yeah, I refer then there to our uh, uh, policy whereby over the years we had taken account for waste facilities as well as landfill, you know, where waste is collected, processed, transported. And that would certainly include recycling facilities. The larger ones, and I've visited quite a few, uh, are not very pleasant places to be around. Uh, and you're absolutely right there. At least temporary landfill sites to a certain extent, because the material is lying there for a long period of time before it's processed in some cases. So um, I think we would try to adopt a fair, reasonable and equitable approach to applying some of the funding to facilities such as those, but still going back to the bulk of the funds going towards the landfill, eh, the sites of where landfill sites are, the communities around landfill sites. John? Yeah, just uh, continuing this theme of recycling and reuse, I mean, I noticed in a couple of the reports, uh, Professor Baird said a project supported by community groups should not distort the principal recycling and reuse markets that are serviced by private sector or local authorities. And uh, Lloyd Austin said uh, the fund should not fund projects that are the responsibility of local authorities or Zero Waste Scotland. I mean, I'm just wondering there how we tie the two together because, I mean, clearly local authorities are not recycling and or even giving residents the opportunity to recycle a whole range of things. So... I mean, is it not good if we can boost other groups to go in and do what the local authorities are not doing, even if the local authorities should be doing it? For example, I've had food recycling. It's just stopped in Glasgow. They say it was a pilot. Disappointing. You know, can't get no garden waste recycling, no glass recycling. So, I mean, if somebody could do that, would that, would that not be good? Lloyd, to be followed by Jamie. Yeah, I, I think this really depends on how you view the responsibilities of a local authority or uh, or, or a, a government agency or, or somebody in the public sector as opposed to a community or a local charity or an NGO of some description or whatever. If the, if the landfill community's fund is for the latter group of people and Parliament has given a statutory responsibility on the former group to do something, should they not do that rather than uh, the, uh, the 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 the, uh, the the third sector pick up that responsibility. Um, you know, I think in a way the the third sector should be adding value to what the statutory sector do, rather than, you know, if they if if they are in a sense forced to pick up the things that local authorities and others can't do, because of lack of funding or whatever, then that means the added value that they would otherwise be able to bring isn't given. Does that make sense? Although it still is added value in one sense, isn't it? Well, if, if, if Parliament has placed a statutory responsibility on a local authority or, a, or an agency, and there is resource for the third sector to do something else, then those two things are happen. If the public agency or the local authority doesn't do what Parliament has asked it to do, and the third sector picks up that responsibility, then you only get one of the two tasks done. Okay, Jamie, to followed by Mary. Yes, I have to say, I think I misinterpreted the, the point that was made in the uh, the paper. So I think what Mary was saying there is she thinks that uh, the fund should allow to uh, to fund recycling activity, which I have to say I'm quite relaxed about. But I think Mr Beatty's response was the one I was more uh, interested in because I'm talking about those who suffer. Clearly people who suffer disimmunity living next to a landfill site, I suppose the point I'm making, I think he has accepted, is people can also suffer disimmunity living next door to particularly larger recycling facilities. And I, I was in, uh, very pleased to hear that uh, the flexibility is used uh, to uh, allow such sites to be included in the scope of the, the scheme. But I suppose the biggest question, should there be an explicit inclusion of such facilities uh, in, in any uh, guidance or any secondary legislation that's taken forward and given that Mr Beattie made the point I, I suppose I'm throwing that question to him primarily but if others comment, could comment as well I'll let you respond Willie before that Miriam it's, there's never been a, since 2002 I think it was, never been any sort of targeting of the Landfill Communities Fund so therefore it's evolved but the, looking at the percentages of what's been funded and where it's been funded 
I think it's fair to say there's been a, a reasonable and fair distribution of funds across various areas, including those that are disadvantaged but without out with a 10 mile radius. So um, it'd be very difficult, I think, to target that and say you've got to spend so much of the fund in, within the 10 mile radius and you'd start to get into 15, 20, 25. And when you get into the highlands and islands, I mean, waste can travel quite a distance uh, before it re reaches a landfill site. I mean, you know. so, so that wasn't my point so much. I suppose I was making the point if we're saying it's within a 10 mile radius of a landfill site, should we also be saying it's within the 10 mile radius? Yes, and it does guide, obviously, only guidance and there's flexibility, but should we be in also including facilities of the type I'm talking about? It, it actually just says landfill sites or waste transfer stations, I think, at the minute, the way it's drafted. And we would support if that uh, description of a waste transfer station was perhaps clarified. Because a, a recycling centre is a waste transfer station because some of the waste ends up going to landfill anyway. That, that, that's useful, thank you. Made it before by Stephen. Yeah. Um, do, if you take one step back from the, the landfill itself, um, where a public community site has engaged with community groups and members of CRNS and enabled them to have uh, sealed containers on site for the collection of reusable materials, all sorts of things, wood, uh, uh, aggregates, um, bicycles, uh, furniture, all sorts of the electrical goods, etc., that can be repaired and reused and then recycled back into their local community. You'll see a reduction in landfill uh, in those, those ways. We have a difficulty in engaging with local authorities to enable us to do that and enable access to the sites for uh, ease of access and reduced cost to, uh, to, to the, the community uh, groups to do that and also there's a scale issue some of them are too small to be able to do it on their own so they need to be able to do it as a, almost as a, 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 a in a geographic kind of cluster um, so we would welcome the opportunity to to engage with local authorities in that way and on a much wider basis so that we actually reduce what actually eventually goes to the landfill there are certain materials that we know um, go uh, to, to landfill which shouldn't be going um, and sometimes they are uh, taken uh, for instance, good quality wooden furniture is often taken then pulped and then made into very poor quality furniture and, and, and put back in at a high cost, I have to say, to, to people in the community. And often our members are serving those on the, the lowest incomes and in great difficulty. And there's a, a, a deprivation and a, a cycle of poverty which is almost uh, engendered if, if they've not got access to good quality reuse and, uh, uh, or repaired furniture or ma other materials. So. Uh, the local authorities, amenity sites, um, and engaging in some kind of tripartite arrangements with local communities and private sector organisations who transport waste would be very welcome to us um, and, and would be something that we would push for. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stephen, to be followed by Jim. Yeah, the discussion's moved on slightly from when I'd initially <laughs> raised my hand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and it was on the issue of the sort of uh, competition, fair competition uh, that you'd alluded to uh, maybe five minutes ago. There's clearly a role for the third sector and community groups in Scotland's zero waste agenda, performing vital services. The issue is to make sure, is, I, I notice in the, in the, in the regulations, is in, a, in addition to the objectives of the, the community's fund, it can fund uh, third sector recycling initiatives. That's been a, that's a new feature compared to the, to, the, to the existing regime. All we call for is a, a level playing field for all operators, whether they're third sector, private sector, operating in the recycling market. And just by quick way of example, uh, if you've got a local authority who's put out a, a tender for inviting bids for a glass recycling service, as you've said, there maybe uh, you know, some of them are pulling different services. So they put out a tender for uh, glass collection. Um, clearly, if you've got private sector and the third sector perfectly entitled to, to bid for that contract, it's maybe slightly unfair if that third sector group had received X thousands of pounds uh, through the fund and in that case, we're able to put forward a more competitive bid. Uh, so all we're looking for is this level playing field, and the regulations and the guidance will have to be looked at to ensure that happens. Uh, OK, you would come in and supplement well, well, Just John? to say, I mean, they're fine if they both want to do it. If nobody wants to do it, would you accept that a, a, an incentive to the third sector or somebody would be useful? Oh, if nobody wants to do it, I'm not sure why a third sector would be more inclined over the private sector to... Well, OK, so, but an incentive would be acceptable then? What sort of incentive? Well, if nobody wants to pick up my glass, we need to give somebody incentive to do it. 
if, if nobody is able to pick up your glass, which suggests that for whatever reason there's not a, a market conditions allowing that service to be delivered. Um, Sorry, Jim. Mary, do you want to come in specifically? Does your chairman at the bit to come in here on this yeah, point? Well, well, well two points. I actually don't think when we're talking about um, trying to reduce and repair and, and, and reduce what's going to landfill that the market necessarily should actually dictate that. Um, and I do agree that there should be some incentive for somebody to pick up the rubbish and the, and, and the glass or whatever else is, is uh, um, seen to be less useful than something else. I also think that the sub third sector um, is often not able to tender on an equal playing field because they don't have the resources of a whole team of people who write professional tender bids um, to go over that in, in the scrutiny and the detail that the private sector would be actually be able to, to uh, you know, uh, allocate that type of resource to. So we're actually disincentive uh, to, to apply for some of these tenders because even when we do, even when we do put things together very well, the amount of time and effort to do so is actually really um, a, a distraction from other, other types of activities. So I would personally... <laughs> very much strongly lobby for an incentive for the third sector to be able to engage on a level playing field to do that very thing. Okay, Jim, been very patient, followed by Jean, who's also been very patient. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect in reality uh, the, these, these two circles don't actually overlap that much. Mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the key is that there has to be a market there, uh, regardless of, of who's in it, or else we're just doing it and it's not supported and it's therefore maybe not the thing we should be doing. Um, I think uh, the community sector, no question, fulfil a valuable role, particularly even in the education and engaging communities around, I don't mean just education, I mean the fact that the types of projects engage well. When you're up in a, a rural community in the Highlands, that's when you find actually there's no private sector presence and therefore the community groups excel and do well. I think where you find there's certain materials like furniture, like reuse, promoting all of that, the private sector is not really interested in that and therefore in reality it's the role and that's where the community sector can step in. Uh, there's a strong social agenda that they bring as well where you see great work going on, employability and so on and welfare back to work. So there's a, there's a huge role for them and it's a welcome opportunity to stick this objective into it. But I think where you see a direct competition we've got to be a little bit careful because if we're subsidising, supporting organisations that are competing with each other, you're distorting the market, and that's not the right way to go. OK, thank you. Jean, to be followed by Willie. Uh, thank you. I, I, I'm sitting here just thinking about the ambition of the, the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, towards zero waste, and logic seems to be saying to me that if we believe I mean I think we're recycling something like 40% I might be completely wrong about that just now but if that's the case and we um, we have ambition uh, to get to 90% or 100% 100 then it's it follows as night the day that, that the landfill uh, delivery trucks are going to reduce to landfill sites and going to increase to transfer uh, waste transfer sites or indeed recycling uh, facilities so uh, somewhere that needs to be reflected surely in our ambition in this in this legislation and I, I come back to the thing that the and where I, I don't deny that the communities uh, who are living next to the, the the landfill site but surely the incentives must all be heavily placed on recycling and, and stopping the stuff getting to a landfill site in the first place and how do we go about doing that? And I, I don't feel at the moment that there's that emphasis in what, we've, in what we're suggesting or even in our, our consultation document that is matching up with, with the ambition of zero waste. OK. Wally? I think we've got to remember this is a relatively small fund. Uh, it really can't be all things to all people. Uh, uh, now, uh, if, if um, you, you take the example of the Cumnock and Dune Valley gift furniture scheme... <laughs> who I know quite well, uh, they will come and take away anything but the wallpaper from your house. That's their sort of snappy catchphrase. And I think it's that level of project that we're talking about here. I think that's what this fund was, was good at in the past and can be good at again because this, this object is being brought in there. Rather than talking about commercial uh, glass collection or, or things like that, and uh, it, it's... It, it's promoting that bottom-up 
process, engaging communities to do something for themselves. And that will ultimately benefit the National Waste Plan because anything that educates people better towards better practices has got to be a good thing. Yeah, I just wanted to comment on Jean's sort of big picture question there. And I think uh, you're absolutely right that um, uh, the, the government, um, at, in common with all countries across the EU, are committed to reducing landfill and ultimately to zero. Um, I think that is, in, t in a sense, that was the purpose of introducing the landfill tax in the first place. It provides a disincentive to land use, and I think I think it was Jim commented earlier. It's over the last 20, 15, 20 years, it has changed the behaviour of the industry quite significantly, and I think that's one of the reasons it's a good scheme. What we're debating here is what happens to the resource that is effectively part of that that goes into the Landfill Communities Fund. And I think even as recipients of some of that fund, we recognize that if the government achieves its overall big uh, picture objective, the amount, and landfill does reduce nearly to z zero, the amount that can be taken out of the tax as a credit to the fund will inevitably reduce to zero as well. The issue is whilst it's reducing, how do we spend it wisest, in the wisest possible way? But I think you have to look at that debate within the context of the wider uh, government policy on, on zero waste, the way in which um, local authorities and other regulators and, and uh, deliverers of services operate. I think this is, this is only part of the answer. And I think if you, if you look back to the sort of zero waste policies generally, it is seen as only part of the answer. Um, I, I don't think we can solve it all through this, but we have to use this resource whilst it exists in the best possible way. Okay, uh, Jenny. I'd just like to uh, uh, echo Willie's point about the scale of the fund and just say, uh, agree that it's really not appropriate for this fund to be funding large scale recy recycling schemes and it's much more appropriate for the bottom up community projects. Um, just, just due to the size of the fund. I mean, we've been talking now for no more than an hour. There's no one who's asked to speak at the moment. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are any burning topics uh, any of the witnesses feel we should uh, still discuss. And then what I'm going to do, after you get a minute or two to reflect on that, is just uh, ask each of our witnesses, if we don't have any further topics... I'm going to be asking each of our witnesses to make a final point that they may wish to make to the committee. Um, so, uh, Malcolm, you seem to have something else you wish to cover. I was slightly intrigued by the Chartered Institute of Waste Management about the exemption for mm. local authorities and SIPA. Uh, and uh, there's just a little comment at the end about what an unintended consequence of no tax being applied might mean less effort being directed to tackling flight I mean, I don't know what extent that was regarded as a serious possibility, but it, it was just interesting to reflect on what could be the unintended consequences of that exemption. Yes, I think, I think the, the wording in the consultation talked about where the uh, owner of the waste couldn't be found and therefore a tax applied. It was a bit unfair for SEPA then to arrange for that to be disposed of and then uh, pick up the landfill tax. Uh, and I think I think uh, we took that not just to illegal disposal in terms of an illegal landfill or an illegal activity, but also fly tipping. So therefore, you know, my council uh, comes along, picks up waste. Uh, okay, so they can't find the owner. And I think Stephen made the point earlier that uh, we want to make sure that they chase the, the perpetrators of that uh, or, or the owner of the waste or whatever. They, they pursue that. So we just wanted to make sure that now you now this might suggest that that SEPA or local authorities wouldn't have to pay the tax. There would be maybe less of an incentive to tackle waste crime, and waste crime is a serious issue. Uh, so it might be just a small unintended consequence. That was all. That that it was just a point just to be made. made that was all. Okay. Right then, I'm going to go around the table then and ask each of our witnesses if there's any further comment they wish to uh, make on any of the issues that we've actually discussed uh, today. I'm going to leave you to the end, Mary, because you kicked us off. <laughs> so, any, anyone else wish to say anything? Um, 
don't all rush at once. Lloyd? This is small and trivial, really, but at the end of our uh, submission and in our evidence to the government, we, we have suggested a few small tweaks of wording uh, for the regulation in uh, regulations in a, a couple of places, and I'll just say that that has been due to our experience of working with distributive uh, environment bodies and uh, Entrust and HMRC in, in the past, and we think that those particular bits of wording, such as income means rather than income includes and, uh, and so forth, that those are just suggestions that try to iron out glitches and problems we've had in the past that would prevent those glitches and problems arising. And I, I commend them to government in thinking about how to finalise the regulation. OK, uh, thank you very much for that. Jenny? Uh, just a related point, really. I would agree that you know it's important that the, that the guidance is clear. And I think it's also point, important from the point of view of um, applicants to the fund at the moment, it's, it's a bit of a maze, really, to work your way through, which is fine, you know, if you're a, a seasoned fundraiser, but for community groups, it's more difficult. And I think it would be welcomed for this scheme to have a clear a central point um, that community groups and bodies can go to to get information about the fund, whether it's a website administered by uh, the Landfill Communities Forum is a possible way of doing it, that, that there's a central information point really for for community groups okay Stephen, have you got any further comments you want to make on any issues that uh, are of concern to CISA no I suppose just in, in closing that uh, um, broadly welcome the proposals as they are they're pleased that they're primarily uh, or more or less in line with the, the existing regime which is the certainty that we're looking for um, there are a number of tweaks here and there such as the dewatering which I think Kind of goes against uh, the grain of maintaining consistency and um, certainty across both regimes and I think it'd be nice to know the actual tax rate sooner rather than later. Thank you. Hey, Willie, you get anything else you want it to It might seem to? a very minor point lost in the, the consultation document but um, the, the, we, we've said that the regulation that says that the regulator could impose such conditions as it sees fit uh, should be reworded to say reasonably sees fit because um, it caused, as, as we say in Scotland, quite a stooshy when that, that, was re that was introduced not that long ago. And it means that the minute the regulator can say, you need to do that. <laughs> Just how often the words reasonable, reasonably and reasonableness are discussed at this committee in various <laughs> contexts and various pieces of legislation. Uh, Jim? Uh, no, nothing to add other than I have to say... Um, kind of reflected quite a few times uh, on Jamie Hepburn's comments the last time because you threw one at me which was what's the implication if this tax is reducing I'm not talking about the, the community's fund but the overall tax I hadn't thought about that you know if it gets devolved and we're, we're, we're on a hundred million pounds downward uh, reducing the budget so I've reflected on what you said and, and, and unless Scotland had it, those additional tax raising powers we're actually losing that fund over, over time. And uh, I kind of reflected on that several times over the past six months, Jamie, let me say that. <laughs> trying to get the OBR to do exactly the same, actually, in their projections. Prepared to reflect that. I cannot remember asking him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your brain has always been a well-owned yes, machine, <laughs> hasn't it, Jamie? And uh, I said, Mary, you'd be the last person uh, among our witnesses to Thank you, Karina. Yeah, so I would reiterate what's free. been said. I would seek simplicity in anything that comes out in terms of application processes for the fund, and I would seek that the uh, emphasis is strongly on community-based groups where they do recycle, reduce and repair, um, and, and on the longer term uh, aspect that uh, Professor Baird just mentioned, I'd refer you back to the paper that I wrote on the French levy system, which would be an adequate replacement for any diminishing fund in the landfill tax. Oh, well, that sounds... Uh, you've, you've you, yeah, you should uh, maybe make sure we have a copy of that then. Um, it's intrigued myself and at least the deputy convener, if no one else. Anyway, um, well, thank you very much for that. I'd like to thank all our witnesses for what was a very uh, lively and involved discussion this morning. Um, we agreed earlier on that we would take the next uh, items in private, so I'm therefore going to close the public session to allow our witnesses and the official report uh, to uh, leave and uh, we'll call a short recess.